All right. Um, this is my son, Christian. He's, uh, he's five years old now, but this is back when he was learning how to walk as a toddler. And uh, after waddling around like a tiny little drunk duck for a while, he did get the hang of it. And I can proudly say that today he's quite fluent at it. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you today about the purpose of education. Because imagine for a minute what the world would look like if we decided to grade our kids on their ability to walk and then stop them from advancing to the next milestone if they didn't adhere to our norm of fluid walking between 12 and 18 months of age. Or imagine what would happen if toddlers decided to give up after failing at it once or twice. Research suggests that the average toddler takes about 2,400 steps per hour traveling roughly seven football fields. And in that hour, they fall down, on average, 17 times. Now, this all adds up to 14,000 steps, 46 football fields, and 100 falls every single day. Children learn new skills incredibly fast, and they don't give up until they've mastered them. So between their first and fourth birthday, they learn how to roll over, eat, sit, crawl, walk, run, talk, and a whole bunch of other very important life skills. So I think it's safe to say that all children are born with something that we call a growth mindset. Now, a growth mindset is the belief that your most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. That natural-born talent is just your starting point. And then on the other hand of the spectrum, you have something we call a fixed mindset. And a fixed mindset is the conviction that qualities like intelligence and talent, that they're fixed. That you only have so much of it, and a lack of inherent skill or talent means there's very little you can do to improve. I don't know about you, but I've never met a child that said, you know what? That whole walking thing? It's just not for me. I have no talent for it. I'm just going to stick to crawling. Even after they fall down 100 times in one day, they keep going. And then they turn four, and they start school. And that transition made me think about the purpose of education. Because it seems like somehow, somewhere in our educational system, that wonderful growth mindset is replaced with a mindset that fixates on end results, developmental progression, and averages. Kids have to measure up to some standard, a norm determined by us, and not meeting those standards means that they are behind or slow. Now, I'm not talking about the extremes here, because I don't want to deny that there is something called developmental delay. But when you look back at the way children learn new things before they start school, then this is kind of an odd system. Every year, the media report headlines like these. Children with step-parents score lower on standardized testing. Here's the thing. I'm a remarried mother. My son has two dads. What exactly are they telling me here? And when you think about it, what message are we sending our kids when we suggest that it's these external factors over which they have no control whatsoever that are going to determine their academic success? I know, I'm pretty sure that that cannot be the purpose of education. All the way through college, grades and test results are used as a measure of success. But then you graduate from college and you have to get a job. Then what? Well, in recent years, my field of research has shifted from fundamental to organizational neuroscience. And what I noticed is that companies are moving away from hiring the smartest kid in class. Hire for attitude, train for skills. Those are the, the buzzwords these days. And that's partly because today's children are going to be working on problems that we don't even know we have yet. Change is going to be the only constant. 
But it seems like the current educational system doesn't really prepare our children for that 21st century work floor. So is there anything that we can do to accomplish that within this system? Well, being a neuroscientist, I turn to the brain to answer that question. Most of our behavior is subconscious. And what our brain does is it tends to take mental shortcuts based on whatever has been successful in the past. Now, that doesn't mean that you have no control over what you process and what you don't process, but consciously processing everything is exhausting, which is why we kind of rely on our brains to do it for us. So instead of going through the maze, it goes straight, like in a straight line. Now, how does that influence education? Our current educational system was developed in the early 20th century, when grades and test results actually were predictive of success. And that thought kind of dominated throughout most of the late 20th century, when today's adults were raised. That would be you, Emmy. High grades and superior test results became our definition of success. And so our brains acted accordingly. Now, fast forward to the 21st century, with all of its technological innovation and fast-paced change. Today, as adult parents and teachers, what we want to do is teach our children dedication, perseverance, and passion. We want to teach them that every child is smart in their own way. That being book smart is not all that matters. And that applying yourself, if you don't succeed the first time, can lead to success you couldn't even dream of at the start. But our brains aren't helping us here because they've been pre-programmed to avoid failure. So let's see if you recognize this, if you have children. You're sitting at the kitchen table with your child, and your child is building a Lego house or a Lego boat or a Lego Batmobile, and you notice that your child is not following the instructions in the booklet. I can already hear some people recognizing this. So you start to help out, until all of a sudden you find that you are now building a Lego boat, or a Lego house, or a Lego Batmobile, and your child is sitting next to you, patiently waiting for you to finish. Or even worse, your child has already left the table and is doing something completely different. <laughs> if this sounds at all familiar, then same here. I study mindset for a living, and yet when I'm sitting at the table with my son and he's coloring, I still have to be mindful of my brain taking over and wanting to avoid failure by taking the pencil from him and just showing him how to color inside the lines. We just want our children to succeed. We want them to feel good about themselves, and we want to protect them from adversity, discomfort, and disappointment. But while we're doing that, we are subconsciously teaching them that they are only smart when they succeed, and they're not doing it right when they color outside the lines, both literally and figuratively. Now, this process also translates to the classroom. When we're teaching a class of children, what we want to do is make sure that every child masters the task at hand. So kids who are struggling get special attention, but the kids who seem to sail through the material effortlessly are praised for the end result, but they don't always get that much feedback on the process that led to that result. Now, this is a subconscious decision on the part of teachers that makes perfect sense because what they want to do is make sure that every child masters the task. But the unintentional consequence is that kids who are not struggling are not taught how to learn. They don't really know why their approach was successful. Now, luckily, there is something we can do about that. We can be aware of what we communicate to our children. And one way to do that is called framing. According to framing theory, the language that you use when you present information influences the choices people make about what to do with that information. 
kind of like mind control. I'm going to give you an example. You have to make a life or death decision for 600 people. Now, instinctively, which option sounds more comforting? With option A, you will be able to save 200 out of 600 people. While option B is going to kill 400 out of 600 people. If you're like most people and you follow your instinct, you're going to go with option A, even though you consciously know that both options are identical. But let's face it, the prospect of saving 200 people sounds a whole lot better than the prospect of killing 400. This is the power of framing. And you can use it to your advantage. Think about the words that you choose when you explain challenging assignments. Do you focus on the desired end result or on what they stand to gain from the assignment itself? And how do you frame failure? Do you frame it as something to be avoided or as something to be valued? And how do you handle your own failure? When your child points out that you made a mistake, what do you do? As a parent or teacher, owning up to your mistakes or admitting that you do not know the answer to something will set the best example imaginable, that it is okay to fail. Now, that doesn't sound right, but it really is okay to fail. And in the classroom, you can frame your lessons in a way that promotes learning-oriented behaviors from your students instead of result-oriented behaviors. So when you're talking to kids who are struggling, you can acknowledge their mistakes, but focus on what they can learn from them, and not on what exactly they did wrong, because they already know that. In other words, you focus on the process, not the end result. And for kids who do really well, do exactly the same thing. Acknowledge their skill level, but focus on the process. One of the best ways to learn is to teach. So why don't you have them explain their method to you or to each other, and then give them feedback on their approach? If we apply these techniques in education and parenting, then we will instill in our children a mindset that will help them achieve the goals they set for themselves without buckling under the pressure of a result-oriented educational system. Now, this is not to say that with a growth mindset, anything is possible and there are no limits, because there are. No matter how hard I try, my fine motor skills are not that great. So I am never going to excel at origami. However, with a growth mindset, I might be able to fold a half-decent origami swan during an afternoon craft session with my son. And I know that because this one is actually mine. <laughs> yeah. And it is pretty half-decent. Thank you. <laughs> Talent exists. We all have limits to our potential, and that's completely okay. But more often than not, we are able to do much more than we imagined possible at first if we approach it not thinking, I cannot do it, period, but I cannot do it yet. Now, I was lucky enough to discover the value of mindset just as I became a mother. And now that my son is going to school, I try in a playful way to instill in him the belief that challenges are fun, and that not succeeding the first time doesn't immediately mean you cannot do it. And to do that, I use stories like the little engine that could. It's the story of a small train that had to carry some pretty heavy coaches over a hill and kept repeating the phrase to himself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I was recently shown the fruits of my labor when my husband was fishing and the fish wouldn't bite. He was very grumpy and about to give up when our son taught him a lesson in perseverance. That's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, it worked wonders on my husband. Yeah. <laughs> The point that I'm trying to make is that education happens at school and at home. I'm not saying that growth mindset theory is the holy grail that's going to fix education, because I don't think that it is. And I'm also not saying that focusing on growth mindset development in children will instantly lead to superior academic results, because there's research out there that suggests it might not. But when you think about all that, Maybe that shouldn't even be the goal. What I am saying is this. Education is a joint effort between parents and teachers. And we could really benefit from communicating with our children from a growth mindset and using growth mindset theory as a framework from which to raise and teach our children. This will instill in them the belief that failure is not a sign of inadequacy and it will help build their resilience in the face of overwhelming changes in the way we live and work in the 21st century. I feel that as parents and teachers, it's our responsibility to teach them these skills, because these skills they will value and use for the rest of their lives. And that, in the end, is the purpose of education. Thank you.